last slide of the last time. That, as I said, that uh, what you are uh, at the moment able to show is that under the, this conjecture, up to now still a conjecture, that if you take uh, rescaling networks of, your, of uh, the network flow and take a limit, you always get something with multiplicity one. Under this conjecture, we are able to show an improvement of the theorem that we saw the other time is that uh, if no length goes to zero, then the flow actually is moved. So there is no a singularity at big time t, a big t. Which means that uh, at every singularity, some catastrophic event must happen. So or a region collapses down or a curve is disappearing. So there is a change of structure. As I said, for a motion with a single curve, a simple embedded curve, at the singularity you have uh, the curve that you're unbounded, but actually also your curve, which is by the Grayson theorem, actually, if you take a sim simple curve in the plane, this curve becomes complex at some point, and it gets rounder and rounder, and it shrinks down to a point in finite time. So also there, the, the, the the length must go to zero. This is no more true for non-embedded curves, actually. But actually, yeah, in a way, we are, in, uh, in all I said up to now, I only discuss the analog of, embed of embedded closed curves when discussing embedded networks. One can also ask the same question I discuss for network flow for immersive networks, where you, you allow your curves to intersect each other, actually but I'm not going to discuss that. Okay, what is the main tool improving this uh, theorem, which is my, my goal today? Well, actually, the main tool is this technique that possibly already saw last week uh, to take a blow up or rescale your flow. There are several, there are well, two main ways to take a rescaling of your flow and take some sort of a limit. One is to parabolic rescale your flow in space and time, having a rescale flow still moving by, by curvature, hoping to have enough compactness to take a limit of this flow, and finding a limit flow which is still a flow by curvature. And then you want to possibly uh, classify these limit flows. And as we will see, for curvature flows or mean curvature flow in general, the, the way to, to classify the limit flows is by means of whisk and monotonicity formula, which also holds for the network flow. Actually, what uh, instead I'm using, I'm using the, the way or scaling things that uh, was introduced by, by whisk and again, in uh, what we call a dynamical rescaling of a flow. So we take uh, S of t is the, is the flow of our network at time t varying between 0 and the singular time big T, which is everything is smooth. I want to remember that uh, I put myself in the situation that uh, we have gamma t is equal to gamma xx over gamma x for every curve, which is also the curvature times the normal plus some lambda tangential velocity times the tangent. And uh, we proceed like this. We define, for, we define also a new time parameter, which tau, which varies between the minus 1 half logarithm of big T and plus infinity. And it is related to the original time by this relation. And then I define the rescaled network as tilde after choosing some point in the plane, we still think to the simplified situation of a triple junction, of a single triad. So you take some x naught here. Also, you can take it here or here at the, at the at the fixed endpoints, uh, whatever, in the plane. And then you rescale around this 
x naught. In this way, you take the original network here at time t of tau around the x naught, and you rescale by this factor. That's the standard whisk and rescaling way. So you get a new flow, a new flow defined on an infinite interval of time, which is this one, differently by the previous one, which was a finite interval of time. And actually, differently, if you take a parabolic flow, actually, this is, this is no more, this flow with tau parameter, a, a curvature flow of a network. So the evolution equation has changed. Actually, if I, I can do this, I write in this way, but actually I, here it is encoded a set of curves like here. So actually it's like I'm rescaling every curve gamma t by this uh, operation. And then if you look at, at the evolution, let me write it here, at the evolution uh, equation of the curve gamma tilde, so I'm going to write down the evolution, of, evolution uh, equation for gamma tilde. Well, actually, what happens is that gamma tilde moves by k tilde, which is the, uh, the, the curvature of the rescaled curve, plus gamma tilde again. So it is no more a motion by a curvature. A motion by curvature would have been this. Instead, in this case of the rescaling, the new evolution law is given by this. So this is simply computation, so I think I can show you. Let's uh, do it here. So if I consider the, the tilde, the tau, this is equal to the tilde over the t times the t over the tau. And actually this the t over the tau I can write it as the tau over the t to the minus one. And now I want to compute this. Then I will compute this by means of the equation over there. If I compute this guy, this guy is uh, okay. I differentiate the numerator gamma t over delta gamma over delta t times 1 over square root of 2 times big T minus T, T of tau, plus gamma minus x naught divided by 2 times big T minus small t to the 3 half, And uh, this is the derivative appearing here. Now I want to multiply by the inverse of this derivative, the tau over the t. If you use that equation there, it's simply 1 over 2 times t minus t tau. So I take the inverse, I have to multiply here, times two times big T minus T of tau. And now you see if I distribute this guy, well, yeah, this I know, it's a curvature because of the evolution equation of gamma. So I have, uh, I take this guy, I put here, so it's like the square root comes up, and here you get k times square root of 2 tau, t big t minus t of tau. Instead here you have, uh, you see you have uh, the same guy to the 3 half times the guy, so this becomes 2 1 half, which is exactly like uh, the rescaled flow. So this is, uh, 
this product is simply gamma tilde. And now last observation is that when you rescale something to some factor, the curvature is rescaled inversely proportional to the same factor. So since we are rescaling by one over square root of two times t minus big T, the curvature of the rescaled, it's the opposite, the inverse, it's exactly this one. So this one, it's simply k tilde, and actually you get this evolution equation. Okay, now what is the idea? The idea is you want to, in order, since we, are, we have our original flow on the integral zero t, now we are enlarging the time of this integral and at the same time dynamically expanding since that factor at some point becomes close to zero. So it's an expansion factor. Expand is the, the, your network, so in a way you are looking at things closer and closer to this guy here, where your network is possibly arriving, and in arriving you are instead enlarging and looking at what's happened, and uh, you want to get some limit. Because some limit, in a way, it's an enlarged vision of what's happening close, to the point x not close to the time big t. So you want, in a way, take some sort, some limit when tau, at least on a sequence, when tau goes to plus infinity of this rescaled flow. You get that limit, the shape of that limit tells you something about your network approaching the point x not when t goes to big t. Well, you can take it. Actually, the limit can be taken because we have enough compactness given by the estimate that I mentioned yesterday. But at the end, well, you get a limit, and then you don't know what to do because you want to have other information on this limit. And the, the technique in order, well, the, technique, the result that tells us something about this limit is actually given by, by the whisk and monotonicity formula that uh, I'm quite sure you already saw it last week, that uh, in the smooth situation for a, for a curve tells you this, take the time derivative of integral of, uh, let me write for a, for a simple curve, e to the minus x minus x naught square. 4t minus t square root of 4 pi t minus t. Let me call the sigma. This means, uh, well, this position x, this means, uh, but this is like you take your curve, at every point you evaluate the position. This is the position vector of your curve, okay? Which Sometimes you find this putting the H1, the Hausdorff measure, yeah, as a measure. In our situation, we are on a curve. We can, as, we can use the arc length parameter. So if you want, all these can be written as the S. And if you want, uh, you can also put here gamma, for instance. But usually it is written with an X, yeah. It's easier to, to use it, so let me put x here. Okay, this, deriv this time derivative, if your curve is moving by mean curvature flow, can be computed. It's a tricky computation, but at the end, straight forward, and you get the same guy there. Applying something which is a square, which is for a curve, k plus the, pro the product of the position vector times the normal divided by 2 times t minus t. 
square. Okay, this is for a for a smooth curve. Close curve moving by mean curvature flow. Well, moving by curvature. Okay, now the good uh, fact is that uh, this formula almost holds also for the motion of a network. If we do the same, take this guy that sometimes is called the Wisken integral, and actually for a, for a network we have free curves, so we have to, to consider the sum on the free curves one to three, but for this, for the three other three curves for a network, you have to sum on the wall, all the old curve of the networks. And this kind of integral we can also write as S of t. So you should, if you take this quantity evaluated on, uh, on your uh, network, this is a kind of uh, weighted length of your, uh, of your network. Uh, well, you get exactly the same result. On, the, on this side, you'll find the integral of S of t or exactly the same quantity. Plus an extra contribution. An extra contribution which is given only by this free boundary point. But no extra contribution coming from here. Because actually in deriving, in computing this derivative, you compute the derivative, then you start doing integration by parts on, on what you get. And uh, integration by parts give you boundary terms. Some boundary terms are related to the endpoints of the network and are there, that I'm going to write in a moment. But uh, Again, like for the computation that we did for the length, for the evolution of the length of a network, that uh, also there, there was integration by parts, but the boundary terms at the triple junction add to zero, so they disappear. In this situation, since this guy is a kind of weighted length, also here, the boundary contribution after integration by parts at the triple junction add to zero at every triple junction. So actually, the corrected monotonicity formula for a network is the same. So let me write it. This, like this, plus <coughs> some, let me call boundary terms, T, coming only from the endpoints. of S of t. No contribution from the triple, the triple junction. So we have a monotonicity formula, but we still call monotonicity formula possibly we are, without the boundary terms, this guy is clearly negative, well, non-positive, so this quantity is decreasing during the flow. Here we have some boundary terms that possibly interact, and this guy is no more monotone in general. But we, still, uh, we can still use this formula. These boundary terms can be computed, but it's not particularly important now. And uh, how to use the monotonicity formula for our problem of understanding what we can get sending tau to plus infinity? Well, actually, monotonicity formula speaks of the original flow, the unscaled flow. Instead, there we have a rescaled flow. So now, the second step is to take this formula and rewrite it in terms of the rescaled flow. If we do that, you get a very nice formula. 
because of uh, the right choice of the rescaling, and that's possibly why we can decide to, to choose this kind of dynamical rescaling, the monotonicity formula be becomes very nice because uh, you see that uh, this is our, our, the motion, our rescaled networks, and the time, the tau derivative of this simple integral here, see that time has gone. Instead here we have a term depending on t, here there is nothing. The sigma is the, um, the arc length measure on the rescaled network. Well, is equal to minus this guy, which is clearly you can recognize the rescaling of this one, simply, plus some rescaling of the boundary terms that I have here. In the case of a closed curve, if you do exactly the same procedure, you don't have this. You have simply the clean formula like that. So once we have this, we can also integrate between uh, a couple of values of tau 1 and tau 2, tau 1, tau 2 living in this interval. And actually, integrating, you see that uh, you integrate here, you have this guy here integrated, it goes here, and integrating a derivative, you only get the values of these uh, rescaled Wisken integrals on S, S not tau 1 minus S not tau 2 plus the integral in time of the boundary, extra boundary terms. So what you see is that this guy is negative, clearly. And this guy depends only on tau 1, which is the smaller. So this guy is smaller than this one plus this other guy. Moreover, this, this other guy, I'm not going to show you the computation, uh, I I asked to upload on the material of my first lecture a survey on what we know at the moment, uh, updated survey on the world network flow and another paper with some details where you can find all the computations that I did at the, um, at the blackboard and uh, several more details of the lecture. For instance, you can find the exact form of this guy if you are curious. And uh, okay, I ask you to, to, to trust me that this last integral is actually uniformly bounded by uni independently of the two times, rescaled times tau 1 and tau 2. So this means that uh, this guy on the, on the left is bounded by this one plus some constant, independent of the time. So I can send tau 1 to the extreme left uh, to this value, minus 1 half log t, and tau 2 to plus infinity. Since the integral, this guy here is positive, so I have monotone convergence, and what I get is that I conclude that this guy, when I integrate on the wall inter inter interval, infinite integral, all this, is always bounded by something which is independent by tau, some constant, depending actually, as you can imagine, by the some value related to the initial network only. Because this guy here is the rescaling of this guy here, and this tau here corresponds to the time zero. So this guy is the rescaling of the Wisken integral evaluated on the initial network of your flow. Plus some constants. So in particular, since the initial network is compact, so you can compute this, this will be some kind of value, at the end, you get the, all this guy is bounded by some constant smaller than plus infinity, so it's finite. So you see you have an integral on an infinite interval of something which is positive, and you get a finite result. So there must be a sequence of the integrand going to zero plus infinity. Otherwise, your, integra your integral must be uh, uh, not finite, infinite. So actually, you can find the sequence tau i such that the integral inside, the integrand inside, which is also an integral, actually must go to zero at the So we found out this. Uh, actually, there, there must be a lot of such sequences because the interval is fine. Actually, in every choice of uh, 
family of intervals that add to an infinite measure, you can find the sequence inside by the same argument. For instance, you, you can have one, and actually you, can, you have to choose a right one. But then on this sequence you have this, and now you take the associated rescaled network to this sequence satisfying this uh, limit here. We have enough compactness using the, in a, pushing a little the inequalities that I showed yesterday on the curvature and derivative of the curvature on lambda and so on in order to get enough comp geometric compactness that uh, up to possible reparametrization of the curves of your network, of the rescaled network, you get some limit that converge in uh, W22, so every curve is in the Sobolev space W22, so second derivative in L2 lock, and uh, strongly in C1 alpha lock, locally in C1 alpha and locally in W22, to something at the end, to some limit network that I call S tilde infinity, that possibly has multiplicities, because, uh, as I said yesterday, there could be two lines getting close and close. And in the limit, you don't see two lines. You only see one because the two lines get superposed one on, a, on the other. This is exactly what, why I need multiplicity one conjecture, to exclude this, to exclude the possibility that this guy, this limit, uh, is uh, obtained by superposition of different parts of the network. Moreover, we still have this. But if uh, we have this, actually, you see that uh, on every ball, this guy here, on every ball, this quantity here is bounded from below. And since it must go to zero, on every fixed ball or fixed radius, this guy inside here must go zero in uh, L2. So since you have a weak convergence, this, this, uh, the curvature is uh, lower semi-continuous in this convergence. So this guy, this guy here is instead continuous because it's the position, position uh, times the, uh, the normal vector and we have C1 convergence. So in the limit, this guy, the integral, this integral on the limit must be lower than the limit for every ball on the limit on the approximating networks. So this means that on every ball, this guy must be zero. But if it is zero on every ball distributionally in uh, W22, then it is zero everywhere. But, okay, but if you have this equation holding in W22, actually, this guy is an L2 function, but this guy instead is a continuous function because we have C1 alpha convergence. So you have a bootstrap argument. So actually, if this one is, uh, C, if, uh, if the position is C1 alpha, this guy here is continuous. This, so this guy, which was in L2, actually is continuous. So it's no more in L2. It means that the position is in C2. Then you go on with the bootstrap, the standard way, and you conclude that uh, this guy that we call shrinker, the guy satisfying this equation we would call shrinker networks, are actually smooth, composed by smooth curves, and the equation actually holds in a classic way. So it's this infinity condition. Why we call uh, the network satisfying this equation shrinkers? Because actually, if a network satisfies this equation and you let it evolve by curvature, it simply shrinks down homothetically to the origin. All these uh, it's a simply an extension of the work of Wisken for uh, hypersurfaces, in particular for curve, and can be extended also to the, to the network flow. The bad point, which is also a problem in the classic mean curvature flow in several situations, is that uh, you see here I told you for a subsequent scalar times, also I still have to extract other subsequence to this in order to find out one converging subsequence with a competence argument. 
So possibly changing the sequence, changing this, the subsequence going to plus infinity, you get a different limit. Possibly two different networks uh, getting out from this procedure. This is a problem also, the, the, blow, the uniqueness, the block limit, also in the standard case, a smooth of mean curvature flow, it's an open problem in several situations. In particular, in our situation, it's an open problem. So you possibly could have two different shrinker limits, even if in some way they both describe the behavior of your network approaching the point x naught when t goes to big T. Okay. Okay, what is a regular shrinker? Well, a regular shrinker is a regular means the same like for network and regular network. You only want to have triple junction and angles of 120 degrees between the free junction. Because, for instance, this guy is a shrinker. Four lines crossing at uh, right angles. You, it's easy to see that this, uh, this equation satisfies k is zero, the curvature is zero, and uh, the projection, the position vector on the normal is clearly zero. And more in general, every collection, finite collection of infinite half lines for the origin is a shrinker, non regular. There is only one regular shrinker. Because you only want one triple junction on the, in this family. There is only one. Only triple junction means that at most we have three half lines. And the three angles must be 120 degrees. So in this family there are a lot, but regular just what this guy that we call uh, um, the regular flat. infinite. Moreover, also a single line for the origin is a shrink. This one without triple junction in this family. But there are several others. As I said, if you take a shrinker and uh, and uh, write down the evolution, this one, which is simply a motion by contraction, because t is a time parameter moving on minus infinity zero, so it's an ancient solution. And uh, your guy, you see, it's clearly the, the flow at time minus one half. Then you get, uh, if your guy is a shrinker, then you get that, uh, that's, the flow is actually a curvature flow. And uh, show you some example, more complicated than simple lines. There is a guy with this topology, which is a shrinker, who was uh, invented by Ken Brake in this uh, book on mean curvature flow and very false and Brake, and where he gave the, the definition of Brake flow. It's called Brake spoon. This guy is called uh, lens. And I guess that uh, it was the, its existence was proven rigorously by a group of people led by Felix Schultz and Oliver Schnurer, actually. And also this guy, I don't remember, sorry, uh, who proved the existence, sometimes it's called the fish. This is a, another, another example. And then the, the existence of this is, I don't think it's uh, rigorously proved actually, and for sure the existence of these other guys are absolutely not proven. And uh, let me tell you that uh, it can be very complicated. This, this one, one, two, and three, for instance, they have no, are compact shrinkers, actually. This guy have these four half lines going to plus infinity, and uh, these this four came from uh, a very nice uh, collection of shrinkers that uh, Tom Ilmanen was able to, let me show the full collection. 
the, that he was able to, to produce. Actually, let me tell you that uh, several of these are not, the existence of several of these is not proven rigorously. There is a kind of classification by the number of regions they contain. So for no regions, you only have the straight line and the infinite flat regular tri triad. A circle is a shrinker with the right radius, one radius, radius one. This is the bracket spoon, the lens, the fish. This is a, <coughs> okay, the names come from Tommy Lannan. Eh? Uh, these are the four with only one region inside. Two regions on things more complicated, compact or non-compact, uh, more and more complicated, and I think stop here. Then there are also example non-embedded examples, and there are shapes. Not all the shapes are possible. Or well, let me tell you that uh, after the second line, it's all conjectural. There are. Uh, good uh, evidence and good numeric evidence, but uh, even this line here, these shapes are conjectural, actually. And uh, instead, also, the last line, again, by numerical evidence, these shapes are not possible at all, with the exception that uh, this guy, theta guy, that uh, this shape is not possible for a shrinker. This was, uh, <coughs> we proved rigorously with my two colleagues in, uh, in Naples, Pietro Baldi and Emanuele House. And the fact that this shape is impossible is actually the reason why a, sh a network with a, with a shape of a theta cannot vanish instantaneously, all uh, as a wall at the, at the same time. So if you don't have a shape, if you're choosing a shape, if you don't have a shrinker with that shape, if it's impossible, then a network with the same topological shape cannot vanish as a wall at a single time. Anyway, there are a lot of geometric conjecture on this guy. For instance, the strongest congest conjecture of Tom Elmanen is that uh, the uh, topological possibility are actually finite. So there is uh, a bound from above on the number of regions that you, real that you actually can add and construct a new shrinker. At some point, you, you cannot go on. But that's only conjectural at the moment. So there are several guys, several possible blow-up limits that you can get. And actually, as you can imagine, the possibilities are related to the topology of uh, the original, of the moving network, with the idea that when you take a limit, the topology can only simplify. So you have a moving network with the low complexity topology, the blow up limit can have at most the same complexity in topology, but they cannot get more complicated. So the lowest the topology of your moving network is, uh, the fewer network blow-up limits you can get take by the procedure. Okay, this is the general framework. Now I want to apply these techniques, uh, the, all these ideas, to show the theorem this theorem here, which was my goal today. So if, if no length goes to zero, you have multiplicity one conjecture valid, then also the curvature is bounded. If you remember that all the curvature goes, is not bounded, or one length is not bounded below positively away from zero. So if I'm able to show this, t cannot be a singular time. So it's a kind of contradiction. T cannot be a maximal time, so the flow is smooth. So assuming, so what is the idea is to look at the possible blow-up limits, try to get information. When we take the blow-up limit, sometimes since we are taking networks, 
expanding networks, sometimes if you put yourself in the wrong point, for instance, in a point which is far from your network, and start expanding to that, you are sending your network to plus infinity, sending away. You don't get anything in the limit. You get an empty set. This can happen. So if it's not empty, well, one, the first consequence of assuming the multiplicity one conjecture is that it is embedded. Because possibly has something like this. Well, if it is intersect itself, since it is a limit of a rescaling of network of the flow, and you want to get close to this, well, one moment before passing to infinity, you are close, so you still, and the convergence is in C1, so you still, you already were intersecting yourself. But you were a rescaling of the network of the flow. And we already saw that during the flow, the network cannot intersect itself. It cannot lose the embeddedness. So this is really impossible. But also this one, this situation, impossible, where there is a touching with a common tangent. Because actually, if I have a touching with common tangent, looking back and uh, choosing the right point, think that you can re-enlarge, enlarge, enlarge this with the right factor, and you are taking an enlarging of something which is already enlarged, and what you produce is actually a double line, which is excluded by the multiplicity one conjecture. Okay, this is a little bit rough, but the idea is like that, that if you have a in contact with the same tangent, enlarging with the right factor, you'll see in the limit a double line, which is forbidden. So this is for, so our limit shrinker is embedded, no, no self-intersection. Then we assumed that all the length are bounded away from zero positively. But then you are enlarging, enlarging of a factor which is going to plus infinity. So all the length are going to plus infinity. So that means that the limit network, all the curves you find in the limit shrinker, limit network, must have infinite length. So guys like this are not allowed. Guys like this are not allowed. You exclude a lot of them. Because actually what can be shown is that if uh, any of a curve belonging to a shrinker must satisfy an equation. Actually, so if, um, if you consider every curve must satisfy k is equal k plus x times the normal equal to zero, then <clears throat> if I parameterize, suppose this curve is a curve of a shrinker. This is gamma. Gamma is a part of our S shrinker. Then gamma must satisfy this. Okay, but what is K? Well, K is gamma. Well, let me put a normal here and here. Then this is the curvature, the vector value curvature, which is actually equal to gamma SS. Instead here, I have the projection of the position vector on the normal, <coughs> which means that this is equal to plus gamma times the normal times the normal equal to zero. And moreover, so if I get back to the original equation, a differentiate arc length, so I consider 
Ks plus S derivative of this guy. When I put the S derivative of this guy on the hex, I get the tangent. And I have tangent times normal, so no contribution. If instead I put the S derivative on the normal, I, I get the minus curvature times the tangent. So this guy here is equal to zero, is equal to Ks plus x times the tangent times the curvature, minus, sorry. Or if you want, like this. Which also can be written if k, well, look at this. Now this is an ODE with an arc length parameter. So suppose that at some point the curvature is zero. If at some point the curvature is zero, also Ks must be zero. So for the uniqueness theorem for the ODEs, actually the curvature must be zero everywhere. So if at a single point the curvature is zero, then the curvature is zero everywhere and you are dealing with a straight line, with a, with a segment. If the curvature is non-zero, some point is non-zero everywhere and it doesn't change sign. So we can assume, for instance, which is positive. So there are two possibilities, or k is identically zero, so segment, or k is always positive, and then ks, so I can divide over k is equal to x times the tangent. And it's a piece of convex curve. And if you look at this equation, you also see that the convexity must be toward the origin. Because being a shrinker, this curve must get close to the origin. So if the convexity was in the opposite direction, it must get, it's getting far during the flow. The second observation is that if you have a segment, the only possibility to satisfy this equation is that the segment is a part of a line passing through the origin. It cannot be a segment everywhere. It must be a part of a line like this. So clearly, so there is another consequence of this uh, ODE that I want to use. Okay, so, no, so before, they must have infinite length for what I said before. If we are in this case, it's not a, a segment. It must be at least an half line. If we are in this case, K is always positive, so it's convex and infinite length, so it starts rotating around your origin. You cannot get back because it's convex. So the only possibility is that it starts doing things like this. Because cannot self-intersect. And that, now I want to exclude this possibility. Actually, let me skip this point, otherwise. Well, actually, There is an analysis by Abrash Langer that they classify all the possible pieces of curves of a, of a shrinker. And uh, there is a result. The analysis is absolutely non-elementary, very, very smart, because this equation is, on, is uh, apparently uh, innocuous, but uh, actually it's quite complicated. And uh, there is a lemma that they, that they follow by their work is that uh, if you consider a curve uh, satisfying this equation, at every round, it must cross itself. It cannot do things like this. I can give you an heuristic argument of this. Look at the equation here, the old one. Yeah. 
here there is the origin. You look at the position, is here, and then you look at the normal, which in this situation more or less points in the same direction. But the point is that this guy here is larger the more you go far from the origin, because there is the position here. So this guy here is larger and larger and smaller and smaller, getting close to the origin. And so the curvature. So the more you are far from the origin, the more you are curving. The closest you are to origin, you are curving less, with the limit that if you want to pass from the origin, if you pass from the origin, x must be zero. So passing from the origin, your curvature is zero. But then you are a straight line. So if you want to pass from the origin, you must be a straight line. The far you go from the origin, the more you are curving. So this has a consequence that actually this curve, curve satisfying this, or either they are lines or they live in a compact set. They cannot go too far. And moreover, this picture is wrong because when I, I'm here, I must curve a lot. So this means that when you pass, you make a turn, you cross yourself. So that's why actually infinite length curve with positive k must intersect each other. Since our curve in our shrinker in this situation must have infinite length, so by this uh, argument must cross itself, they simply cannot be present. So in this situation of bound from below the length, all the blow up limit shrinker must be composed only by half lines. Half lines that are part of lines passing for the origin. But then they really originate in the origin. Because if you have an half line, here you have the origin, your half line stops here. Since you have C1 convergent, convergence, this guy being limit or regular network must still have regular um, triple junction. So angles of 120 degrees. So this means that if your half line stops here, then you have other two curves starting from here, forming an angle on 120 degrees. And they cannot be half lines, because they don't pass from the origin. So the only possibility is that all the half lines originate from the origin. But then, since there is only this guy passing from the origin regular, or a line, these two guys are the only possible limits that you can find out by this, uh, by this procedure. In general, by this, by this argument, every time you have something unbounded, which means uh, infinite length, must be an half line or a line by the same argument. So at the end, you conclude that uh, the limit network coming out of this procedure is done either by a regular triad, flat and infinite, or a line for the origin, or the empty set, as I said at the beginning, or there's an exception to all this. All this is true if x naught doesn't go in the end point. Then you require a special treatment, but uh, I think you can believe me that if you put x naught here, what you get, it's a simple one half line after the rescaling. So in the special case that you put, you put x naught in the end point of the network, the blow up produce a single half line. Anyway, I don't want to discuss too much this case, but uh, as I told you at the beginning, the endpoints are usually dealt with uh, by a reflection argument. You reflect your network 
centrally around the, the endpoints, and then you consider the new network where this guy is no more an endpoint. It's an inner point of the network. And then you get the same, the, you use the analysis for the interior points. So this is more or less what I wrote. At the end, you get only this possibility with this uh, offline only in this situation here. And uh, with some effort, you can, even without assuming multiplicity one conjecture, with some effort, you can be able to show that uh, the triad or the half line already has multiplicity one. But instead, there is no way, because actually it's a problem also in the smooth case of a curve, in the classical case of closed curve, to conclude that the straight line that you get here cannot have possibly multiplicity larger than one. So we absolutely need to assume. And actually, the multiplicity one conjecture can be a little bit weakened, asking that uh, you cannot get double lines. Will be sufficient for all the, all the all the conclusion, but okay, we take the multiplicity one conjecture, so all these guys that you find have, have multiplicity one. Notice that they all have zero curvature. Curvature is gone in the limit. So morally, you have taken your, uh, uh, your evolving network, assuming length are not going to zero, then the other theorem tells you that the curvature must go to plus infinity. Then you are rescaling things, and when you rescale things in that way, a la Wisken, actually the curvature is not going away, it's always there. And actually, you expect to be still present in the limit. Instead, here in the limit, the curvature is gone. So, if you morally can formalize this argument that the, you are not enlarging too much, the curvature is still there, and some curvature must survive in the limit, then you get a contradiction. Because all the limits that we found out have no curvature at all. And they cannot hide curvature in the triple junction. Or doing, like I said yesterday, that there was a two very curved guys that uh, with a curvature concentrated that vanish in the limit, because this is prevented by the multiplicity one conjecture. But this is only heuristics. But actually, what you can do is that uh, if you get an empty set, means simply that uh, your network is not getting close to your point. So you can, in a way, forget the fact. The meaningful points are the point, the reachable points, where the network is arriving when t becomes, get close to big T. If you get a line, there was a, there is around a, a very useful and a famous theorem of Brian White that says that if you get a multiplicity in one line in mean curvature, in, in, in curvature of, uh, for curves, then locally the curvature around the point x naught is locally uniformly bounded in time, up to time big T. So it's a local regularity theorem. If every, kind, every time you, you, take the, you make this blob procedure, you get a limit, you get a multiplicity one line, locally be, the curvature still stay bounded. Locally in R2, curvature stays bounded. So it's a very strong and useful theorem by Brian White which was more or less the basis to generalize it to, oh, this is okay, for a half line you do this reflection argument and you get back to the Brian White situation because if you get an half line here and you reflect, you will get also the other half line, so at the end you will get a, a line with the multiplicity one, so you get back to Brian, to Brian White theorem, and so you have the, in this area the curvature is bounded. But the non-elementary generalization was to generalize the Brian White theorem to when you get a triple junction like this. Actually, we did it more or less independently at the same time, 
with the Matteo Novaga and, uh, and uh, Annibale Magni and uh, Tom Ilmane and René Neves and Felix Schulz. And let me, and uh, so we have the same conclusion than in White Theorem that if you take a blow up limit and you get an infinite uh, flat uh, regular triad, then locally you get your curvature is uniformly bounded in, uh, in time. So actually, since uh, we can only get these guys, and in all these situations, the curvature is locally bounded uniformly in time, then you can conclude that the curvature is bounded for the whole network uniformly in time, which is a contradiction, because we have a theorem saying that if the length are not going to zero, the curvature must be unbounded. And uh, this is the conclusion of this proof. Let me only make a couple of comments on uh, the, again, I will be a little bit uh, rough, but the, the proof by Ilmanen and uh, Neves Schulz of the analog of, Black, uh, of uh, White Theorem, it's actually more or less along the same line, a, a generalization with the same techniques uh, to the situation of a triple junction, the same line when instead you get a line. And it can be seen, like, like White theorem, it's kind of a local regularity result for mean curvature flow or for curvature flow of curves. These results must be seen as a local regularity result for the motion of regular networks, for the motion of networks with free because uh, you can always, for a general network, if the length are not going to zero, which means that triple junction not getting too close each other. Because when they get too close, you can prove that the curve connecting them is going to zero. So if you have a bound from below on the left, two triple junctions, they don't get too close. If they don't get too close, which means that restricting the area that you are looking, you, on, you can only see a single triple junction. And a single triple junction after the blow up, no other triple junction coming in. So you are looking at things locally. You get, a triple, you, you get a, an infinite flat triode, and then you use the theorem. So it's a kind of local regularity results analogous of White's theorem for network flow. And uh, why? Why our proof was different? Um, well, we used the different uh, line by White's one. Well, we also used, at some point, the White result. More or less, the idea was to, uh, we have this guy here. Which is moving. And you know that uh, enlarging and enlarging by the hypothesis that you get a triple junction, you continue to see things that are getting closer and closer to the flat. So the curvature apparently is going away, but things that you are looking smaller and smaller. At some point, you get very close to an infinite flat trio. Very, very close. And uh, White's theorem tells you that uh, you have uh, here in the annulus, you are getting close to this uh, straight segment, here to this segment, here to this segment. White's theorem provides estimate on how close you are, not only in C1, but in uh, C infinity, actually, or C2 is sufficient, that uh, you are getting very, very close in a strong norm here. Then using some geometric, uh, geometric analytic ideas of, uh, taken by the papers by Mark Grayson, Angenant, and uh, in particular some estimates of uh, Eckhart and Wisken, what you can show is that you can control the rate of the curvature going to plus infinity, if it does, at this inside here, in, inside the 
annulus. So in a way, the curvature can go to plus infinity, but the interior estimates of Eckhart and Wiskin tells you that it can do after some time. And this time is larger and larger, the closest you are to something with the, few, with the low curvature, like here. So at some point, your Eckhart and Wiskin estimates tells you that uh, it takes too much time to become unbounded, to go to plus infinity, more than the time that you assumed was uh, close to the, to the maximal time of to the big T. So as a contradiction, you get, uh, yes, the curvature can go to plus infinity, but at big T plus epsilon. So that means that a big T didn't go to plus infinity. So you have an estimate of this kind. When, because you are very close to something with zero curvature, even if inside here you are not too much, but it's sufficient that you are very close in a suitable annulus like this. So it's a matter of uh, this kind of estimate. And these things can be generalized when you get different uh, blow up limits, again with zero curvature. So not only in this situation, but also for instance, a situation that we will see tomorrow, that you will have, for instance, four lines cross, or two lines crossing or four half lines forming angles of 120 degrees and 60. We will see that also when you take a blow up limit in this situation, your curvature must be bounded. You assume it more or less can be done along the same lines. Or morally, when you get a blow up limit with zero curvature, usually the curvature of the original flow was bounded, cannot go to plus infinity. This is only morally. To show this rigorously is <laughs> not so easy. Okay, so last five minutes. So from now on, we assume the multiplicity one conjecture. And uh, we conclude that uh, at a singular point, one length must go to zero. So there are two situations, either one length goes to zero or a region goes to zero, carrying the, all the length for the curves bounding the region going to, zero, going to zero. But anyway, we can separate in two situations. While the length is going to zero, the curvature stay bounded, or while the length of some curve goes to zero, the curvature goes to plus infinity or, or better, general is simply unbounded. And we want to analyze the two cases. Actually, in the smooth situation, what happens, uh, we don't have this fact that the length goes to zero. We only have uh, the curvature that must be, the, must be unbounded. And actually, it's possible to, to, to work out an estimate that actually has also analog in uh, higher dimension, that at a singular time, the maximum of the modulus of the curvature is unbounded by some constant. Cannot go to plus infinity weaker than this rate. It must go to plus infinity at least with this rate. And let me mention that the analogous statement that we believe for, the, for a network, uh, it's actually an open problem. We are not able to, to prove it. We have another rate from below on the blow up of the curvature, but far from this one. And actually, you can classify then, so this is the minimum rate of blow up of the curvature. Then you can classify singularities by a bound from above. So if you have a bound from above of the same order, one over square root of t minus t, these are called type one singularities. I think the terminology was possibly introduced by Hamilton for Ricci flow, possibly someone knows better than me, but. <laughs> okay, if instead you don't have this bound from above, that actually implies that the order of k max at time t is this one. Well, you say you have type two singularities, the other singularities, which usually are the more, more difficult to be dealt with. But uh, as a suggestion of Tobit Manning, he said, okay, network flow has other example of type zero singularities, which means singularities with bounded curvature, with curvature not going to plus infinity, 
which actually it's going to what is happening uh, that I'm going to show you tomorrow that uh, you can have a collapse of curves with bounded curvature and actually this is uh, in two direction uh, what I'm going to try to show tomorrow and possibly also on Friday that uh, there will be two situations, collapse of a curve with bounded curvature, collapse of a region with unbounded curvature, and vice versa. If you have a singularities with curvature unbounded, must be present one region collapsing, and if you have a singularity with bounded uh, uh, curvature, only a single curve isolated, isolated, I'm going to tell you in, in a moment what this means, must be vanishing, not a region. There is a dichotomy related to the behavior of the curvature. Bounded, single curve, unbounded, a region is collapsing. And what does it mean isolated? this situation, I suppose that this curve is uh, vanishing during the flow when t goes to big t. And then you get what I mentioned several times. Curve is disappearing. In this case, we will see that the curvature is bounded. And if the curvature is bounded, this is the case. Okay, but one can say, okay, I can imagine that there are no region collapsing, but two curves, one and the other here, are both collapsing at the same time. Still, the region are not collapsing, only two curves. Okay, but uh, what happens in this situation if uh, we have something like this? Well. This curve is collapsing, so here yeah, you have to think that there is an angle of 120 degrees, like here, here, and here. And if you collapse these two, you see that these two curves that they survive have the same tangent. This curve, let's call it one, becomes one, and curve two becomes another curve here with the same tangent. And then we will have uh, this one, and another also here. Also this one, this is three and four. Like this. Now with an argument similar to the what I used before to exclude the possibility that in the limit you get a non-embedded limit network. Also here, if you have two curves coming to a same uh, uh, coming to the same junction with the same tangent, with a, an appropriate choice of points and the scaling, I still, if I get very close to here and rescaling, enlarging very few, I can produce a double line again in the limit, which is excluded by the multiplicity one conjecture. So two curves close to here cannot collapse together because of this argument. But if you then say, okay, I try with three curves. Well, when they can collapse? Well, if all this region collapse, then they can do. But then exactly what I want to exclude, that there is a region collapsing. If you try to do, now we have, one has to do some cases. One can try to do with three. One, two, and three. A three, all collapsing. And remember, you always have 120 degrees angles. This is even easier, because if you collapse this three, these two not collapsing go to cross. And this is even easier to exclude. You don't even need the multiplicity one conjecture. Simply, you exclude the possibility of intersection. So again, if you have a situation like this of collapse, this must close, and all the region must collapse. And the same if you have five curves together. More than five, well, more than this, 
starts being useless because it's easy to, to conclude that uh, you cannot collapse uh, without collapsing a world region. Otherwise, you get self-intersection, and this is excluded. The only possibly delicate situation that would require a little bit careful argument and the use of multiplicity one conjecture is this situation of two curves. Because in the limit, you get something like this that apparently could be good, but it is excluded by the multiplicity one conjecture. So the two real cases will be single curve isolated, possibly several single curves, but not touching each other, collapsing, or one region collapsing. And in the two cases, in the first curvature is bounded, in the second curvature is not bounded. And these two cases will describe all the possible singularities of the network flow. The first case, we, can, we are able up to the multiplicity one conjecture to treat in details. The second case, instead, we, are, uh, we have a less precise description of what's going on, and we also need another assumption, which at the moment is only conjectural. Okay, stop here.